I greet you all again this morning in the lovely name of Jesus Christ. There is no more beautiful name that our ears can hear and that our hearts can love and embrace. If you have a cell phone, would you please check it now and make sure that it's on mute. I don't see visitors with little ones, so I will spare us that announcement. You all know what to do with your children. <clears throat> this morning, uh, we begin a new series of messages. This will be allegedly a brief series. going to be considering uh, something that I've never done a series on, and I do pray that you will find it most useful. <clears throat> I pray that your heart will be enriched this morning and even challenged. <clears throat> We're going to be reading from Romans chapter 8, the epistle of Paul to the Romans chapter 8. Now, our focus is verses 12 through 14. That's where we're going to spend most of our time in the next few messages. But we're going to read beginning with verse 1 today because I think it essential that we have the context before we drop anchor in verses 12 through 14. The context is vital, and I want all of us uh, to have at least some good feel for that. Uh, I, I have had some questions. Let me try to do some clarification quickly. <clears throat> uh, it is my hope to begin the epistle to the Hebrews as the next extended series of expositions. But between the end of Matthew and the beginning of Hebrews, I want to do a handful of brief series on subjects that I think should be addressed to us. I will not project how long those will take, um, but I, I want us to look here uh, at the series begun today. I want us to take them seriously and to set in our hearts that what we hear from the lips of Paul is from the lips of Christ and that it is Christ speaking to his church. I want to speak about a, a highly neglected issue. Secondly, I want to consider not quenching, grieving, or resisting the Holy Spirit. Let's give some time to that vital matter. Brethren, I believe there's a reason that we don't know the power of God's Spirit here when we meet uh, more than we do. I thank God for every visitation. I thank God for every sense of His power. Uh, and we do feel that here occasionally. But the fact of the matter is, <clears throat> when we look through the Scriptures, there are phrases that I cannot escape. There are realities of the Holy Spirit that I simply do not see most professing Christians and many here experiencing. And I believe while there may be a number of reasons for that, lying at the heart of it, in my opinion, is grieving, quenching, and resisting the Holy Spirit. So we want to spend some time thinking about that. There are a couple of other things that I'm praying about. We'll see when we get there. But uh, we will eventually, God willing, take up the epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, someone also even called me long distance to ask me what happened to Galatians. And uh, the answer is life. 
Um, <clears throat> I intend to come back to Galatians. Uh, there are quite a number of reasons uh, in the next uh, four weeks uh, that Pastor Clarence is going to be preaching on Wednesdays. Uh, I'm not going to be in the pulpit uh, for at least a month. So uh, I would ask you to pray regarding that absence. Pray for my beloved brother as he comes to bring his always edifying sermons. Uh, when I return uh, to the pulpit on Wednesdays, it is my hope that I will have had enough time to, to spend with uh, the, some very controversial aspects of, of Paul's epistle to the Galatians. Well, that being said, uh, we want to read now Romans chapter 8. We're going to read verses 11 through 17. Excuse me, verses 1 through 17. And I urge you to hear all the word of God. Focus with me on verses 12 through 14. Well, let's stand and let's give our attention to the inspired and infallible word of God. <clears throat> there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of spirit, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God but ye are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Let me read that again. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, the spirit of Adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. 
If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his inspired, infallible, and preserved word. Let's unite our hearts at the throne of grace. Chase away every distraction. Pray. <clears throat> Holy and righteous Father, we come into thy presence Lord, thy presence is awesome. Why don't we feel awesome? Lord God, come by the mighty power of thy spirit. Breathe the winds of life here. O oh, blessed spirit of God. O oh, power of creation. O oh, power of the resurrection of Christ. Work in us today. Move by that mighty power. Open our eyes. Open the eyes of our understanding that we might truly grasp the exceeding greatness of thy power to usward who believe. Come, Lord. Shake us out of every bit of fleshy religion. Help us by thy grace to resist distraction. Help us by thy grace to fix our mind on our loving Father, our blessed head, Christ Jesus, and the Holy Spirit that grants us life. Oh God, oh God, how glorious thou art. Heaven shouts thy glory. Heaven cries out, holy, holy, holy. Make us know that here this morning. Oh God, may it not be the demonic cry of flesh, flesh, flesh here. But Lord, that thy spirit would kindle a fire in our souls by which we would cry out to our God, that we would come running, bringing our hearts and souls to him, that we might hear the word, that we might bow to the word, that we might love the word, that we might obey the word. Oh, set Christ before us. Set our lovely Savior. Set our beautiful Redeemer and King before us. Help us to see him with the eye of faith. May we love him. May we love him. Father, may we see that he is altogether worthy of our greatest love. Love us, O oh Christ. Come love thy bride here this morning. May the power of thy spirit and of thy word melt hard hearts. Break up the flinty hearts. Heal the broken hearts. O oh God, set fire to the cold hearts. Come, do thy work. We long for thee as the heart panteth. After the water brooks, may every regenerate soul here say, So my heart panteth for thee, O God. My soul thirsteth, O God, for the living God. Come with thy life creating forces, O Holy Spirit. Come and blow upon our hearts. Scatter the darkness, shine the light of Christ. And of the infallible word of God. Save the lost. Grip them with their lostness. Make them to see, O oh God, their desperate need of thee. And make them to see that Christ is a willing Savior. And O oh my God, have I pray that thy people would be filled. Not only with a sense of thy great holiness. But of Thy great love, say unto our souls, I am thy God. Meet with us in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Paul's letter to the Romans includes 
his most beautiful explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ in his writings. Romans is one of the best known books of the Bible. One of the most influential theological treatises in church history. And one of the most important letters, if not the most important, in world history. <coughs> Why? Why make those claims? Because Paul's letter to the Roman makes the Romans the following clear. The perfect righteousness that God demands of sinners is entirely out of their reach. And the only way that any sinful person obtains it is through God's mercy, grace, and love in Jesus Christ, which is revealed in the gospel and received by faith alone. Furthermore, some believe that chapter 8 is not only the greatest chapter in Paul's letter, but the greatest chapter in the Bible. It begins with no condemnation to Christians and ends with no separation from God's love in Christ for Christians. What glorious book ends. The beauty of a life empowered by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to hit that a lot. I mean, pre be prepared because many of us are not living it. You talk about the Holy Spirit, you know nothing of His power. I want you to walk in His power. God's people are supernatural people. Not corpses with a few religious thoughts hanging in their brains. The beauty of a life empowered by the Holy Spirit. The astonishing privilege of being adopted as God's children and the glorious description of God's predestinating grace brings this great chapter to an end with a soaring declaration of assurance. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So, what a feast of fat things for God's people. I urge you why we are here to read this chapter repeatedly. Because you won't truly understand that crescendo of assurance if you don't understand what Paul's saying beginning at verse 1. Now, our purpose is to focus on one vital aspect of this extraordinary chapter. An aspect of the spirit-empowered life that is misunderstood or neglected by believers in every generation. The mortification of sin. If the word sounds strange to you, repent and read your Bible. If it is something that is foreign to you as a Christian. Repent and read your Bible and pray that God will make this a burning reality in your heart. Because as we will see, this is a vital discipline of the Christian life. So, with that in mind, we begin a series of expositions on this crucial Work of the Holy Spirit in sanctification. 
Uh, so the series is entitled Spirit Empowered Mortification. This is not something that can be done in the flesh. Now, how important is mortification? Let me ask the question again. If you're distracted, get undistracted. How important is mortification? The great Puritan pastor and theologian John Owen wrote the following in his remarkable book of the mortification of sin in believers, which we publish, by the way. He says, do you mortify? Do you make it your daily work? Be always at it whilst you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. I repeat the question. How important is that? How important is that? Be killing sin or it will be killing you. May the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, enlighten the eyes of our understanding and teach us how to mortify the deeds of the body by the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. This is no option. As you will see, this will tell you your spiritual condition. If you want to know where you're at, this doctrine will tell you clearly. Mortify, mortify the deeds of the body by the mighty power of the Spirit. Why? For the good of Christ's people, for the joy of their walk with the Lord, and for the glory of our triune God. Well, our first thought is this. Paul speaks of our wonderful life in the Spirit. This is verses 1 through 11. I apologize to all. It is a bird's eye view. I would love to stop at every verse, but I can't. To understand properly the nature and duty of mortification, we must first understand the context in which it appears. And I trust that that will become obvious to you as we work our way through. We hear the word mortify for the first time in verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Well, what does that mean? We want to give some thought to it. Paul draws a contrast, but it's not a parallel. You need to pay attention to things like that. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die die. But if ye through the Spirit, through the power of God's Holy Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. We need to understand a few things. A few things that Paul says in previous chapters before considering life in the Spirit and the doctrine of mortification. In chapters 1 and 2, Paul says that the whole world, Jews and Gentiles, stand guilty and condemned before God. The wrath of God, the wrath of God, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That means who suppress the truth. To hold it down. He then says of Jew and Gentile in chapter 3. There is none righteous. You hear that? You're not righteous. There is none righteous. You may have the filthy rags of your works. But those won't be enough. 
There is none righteous, Jew or Gentile. No, not one. All are under the condemnation of God. Nevertheless, the apostle also announces the righteousness of God is by faith of Jesus Christ. Now, faith of Jesus Christ means faith in which Jesus Christ is the object. Is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. We may have the required righteousness, but it comes one way only. Faith in Christ. Jew and Gentile are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins. Remission, children, means forgiveness. The forgiveness of sins. We conclude, Paul says, that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. The Jews especially needed to hear that. He explains in chapter 4 that this is nothing new, but truth plainly proclaimed in the Old Testament. Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. Paul goes on, chapter 5, verse 1, saying, being justified by faith, being declared righteous by God the judge, because we have exercised faith in his crucified and resurrected son. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the apostle ends that chapter declaring, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so grace, even so might grace reign through the righteousness, through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Chapter 6 tells us that we are in union with that Christ in his death and his resurrection. Therefore, sin shall have no dominion over us. Now, how much do you believe that? How much do you believe that sin shall not have dominion over you? The way you answer that, once again, will tell you your spiritual condition. It will give you a very big hint. <clears throat> if not a blaring trumpet. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Now that means something. And it means something that we should be living by. He goes on in chapter 7. And in which he speaks to the place of God's law in the life of believers. He puts it this way. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, this is true spiritual self-awareness. Something you and I need highly developed. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Ever felt like that? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all this brings us to chapter 8 and Paul's thrilling proclamation. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Let me say it again. If your heart's dull, slow, barely alive this morning, listen to the words of God. There is therefore now, now, 
no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Now, there's some important qualifiers there. But it's one of the greatest things your ears will ever hear. Furthermore, because we are justified by faith in Christ through the glorious work, the person and work of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> we have peace with God. That's what was declared back in chapter 5. I mean, people pay psychiatrists every day un, ungodly, unseemly amounts of money <clears throat> because they have no peace. Sin won't give you any peace. Not any lasting peace. So with that in mind, with these things I trust in our minds, we need to consider now a brief overview of life in the Holy Spirit as described. Another way of saying this would be the justified life is a spirit-filled life, a spirit-empowered life. If you are justified, I'm setting some theological thoughts before you right now because it's vital. Paul has been working through these thoughts all the way through the chapters of Romans. There is no such thing as a justified life that is not being a sanctified life. It doesn't exist except in the minds of heretics and lost people. Justification and sanctification are different things, but they cannot biblically be separated. There are no justified people that are not being sanctified by God. There are no sanctified people that haven't been justified by God. So, Paul now says, as we take up verse 1, there exists, uh, there exists no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Now, that's the key. That's the key. <clears throat> verse 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in, in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. First thought under that is this. There's no condemnation because of Christ's finished work. There's no condemnation to God's people because of Christ's finished work. Not anything that they're able to do. Not any works. Not any attitudes. That's not what gets it. It is because of the glorious, finished work of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. Now, no condemnation. That is the heart and soul. That is the, that is, the, after a long night of darkness, when the sun comes up and the rays shatter the darkness, that's what the gospel did to the world. And it was because of the person and work of Christ, not because of religious men, not because of their, their unions, not because of their denominations, not because of how many people they've had or how long they've been here. It was the work, the person and work of Jesus Christ alone. That's why there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And that statement, no condemnation, is the theme of the whole chapter. Paul works out that theme consistently, incrementally, till he gets to the end of the chapter. That's one of the reasons the, the doctrine of predestination is so important. It robs fleshly men and women of their religious pride. You find people that hate predestination, you generally find someone so full of man-centered doctrine they can't see what Scripture's saying. <clears throat> the, 
the previous chapters of Romans have shown us that Jesus is our sin-bearing substitute. God set him forth as the propitiation, that is, an appeasement. Children, propitiation is a big word. Uh, <clears throat> it only appears four times in the New Testament, but it's a central doctrine to the gospel. A propitiation is an appeasement. Now, what do we mean by that? Uh, if, I, if I were to put it in as simple a way as I know how to, it's a sacrifice that satisfies God's wrath for believers' sins. It's a sacrifice that turns away God's anger. Isn't that something you want to know about? Isn't that something you want to believe? Isn't that something you want to lay hold of with all of your heart? A sacrifice that turns away God's anger from a sinner such as I. This is what Paul has said before us in the early chapters. Ah, Jesus stood in our place. He took the full penalty of all our sins when God nailed him to the cross of Golgotha. Believers are no longer at war with God because of their sins. Did, I tell you what, this is shouting stuff here. I mean, is your heart kicking over at all? I mean, is, is the key in the ignition? Is, is anything happening in your mind, in your thoughts? This is why we live. This is why we can say no condemnation. No condemnation. You're going to fail today in some level. Are you going to just say, oh, well, you know, it's all I'm saved by grace. That's about all there is to it. Well, that's true. But the rest of this chapter, chapter will steal that from you as some kind of hope that you're, you're a believer. We want to hear about this propitiation so that we can truly climb up that glorious ladder to assurance that Paul is talking about. And it strips away all human action from the issue of justification. Now, believers, let me say it again, just in the event that you might have sinned the last day or two. Believers are no longer at war. They are no longer at war with God. They are no longer at war with God. Do you understand? Those of you that are lost here today, those of you that are not Christians, you are God's enemy. And the scripture says something much more earth shattering. God is your enemy. You hear that? He's not grandpa sitting up in the sky. He's not sitting up there going, oh, I wish some of those people down there would just let me do something. That's being preached today out of thousands of pulpits. That God doesn't save anybody. He just has put together some things so that they can save themselves. But the God of this chapter saves because of the work of his son. And that takes away our war with God. As Jesus hung upon the cross between heaven and earth, God the righteous judge poured out all his wrath, all his judgment upon him once and forever. The tyranny and the condemnation of God's law is forever Finished in the blood of Christ. You cannot be charged with your crimes. Because Christ pled for them all. Now that should fill every believer's heart with joy. Does it? Huh? Yeah, I've heard all that. Do you live all that? It's not a mental game. 
It's not a fire insurance policy. The God of Paul saves sinners. And they can be identified. We're going to see at least one way in this chapter. But you see, it's all built on the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he does to sinners as well as what he does for sinners. People say, if you believe that stuff that y'all believe, people don't have any assurance. I don't know what Bible you're reading, and I don't know what books you're reading, but I can tell you, this is what cements assurance. Because it's God's work. He gets the glory for every sinner saved. And that should fill us with praise. I mean, praise. Do you praise the Lord? Do you live the Christian life? Do you praise the Lord? When you hear who he is, do you, when you hear what he's done, when you see the love, the, the astounding, the astonishing, the incomprehensible love of God poured out, the only way we can really grasp it is to look at that writhing body upon the cross. And here it is finished. Oh, there's love. Not the filth that this world pours out every day from a Hollywood and in its media. This is a love perverted generation. They don't know what it is. You don't know it until you know the God of love. And you don't know that God of love until you know the son of his love. Oh, he's glorious. When you understand the grace of God, you won't have to go to the bookstore to buy a book on how to worship. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't things about worship that you need to be instructed in. But what I'm telling you is that when you understand that God came to you in your darkness and opened your heart and showed you the glory and the beauty of his son, you will praise him. You will thank him for all his day that he did not leave you in your dung heap. No, he sought you out. Well, there are two kinds of people then in this particular world, in this thing that, that Paul is talking about here. Two kinds of people. There's no condemnation because of the person and work of Christ. And then Paul mentions two kinds of people. It's in an indirect way. <clears throat> those who walk after the flesh and those who walk after the spirit. Which, by the way, the word after there might be. Uh, not the way we often use it in our day, but the, it's, it's being used with the sense of according to the flesh, according to the spirit. Now, where you sit right now, and you need to take serious personal account of this. You're either living according to the flesh or you are living according to the spirit. There's no middle ground. There's no halfway house. You are in the flesh or you are in the spirit. You must understand that as you read what Paul is saying. Unfortunately, now I know some of you are not going to believe this, but I don't like theological controversy. But there's no way to live in this world and uh, be called to serve God's people and not deal with it all the time. Of course, there's a controversy about what I've just said. And there's going to be a controversy about everything that I say. And, and, and because virtually everything in Christianity is full of controversy. And everybody chooses up their teams like football teams. And they say, yay, my team. And then they turn off their ability to think. <clears throat> so, unfortunately, and I do say that, unfortunately... 
Some teach that this passage presents two kinds of Christians. I trust you can see immediately by the words that we have read uh, what a problem that actually raises. But if not, just listen carefully. I want you to get this. Young people, turn on, t t power up. Listen. It is in many circles that would call themselves evangelicals that the two kinds of people, the two people groups, so to speak, being spoken about here are Christians that walk according to the flesh, therefore called carnal Christians, building upon what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, and Christians that walk according to the Spirit. So they teach boldly, blatantly, there's two kinds of Christians. There are those that are sitting in the grandstand watching the fired up Christians run around on the football field. That's the way they preach it. I've heard it numerous times. Right? So it's like you've got Christians that don't love Christ, don't love His Word, don't love holiness, but love the world. But we've got to tell them they're Christians. Not according to Paul. But that's what we get. We get, oh, the carnal Christian. Listen, I, I lived in that doctrine. I grew up with that doctrine. Every time I even felt the first twinge of conviction, I ran to the loving arms of the carnal Christian. It is a lie and a damnable doctrine. The way it's taught, there are carnal Christians. But it's not a big holding tank of people sitting up in the stands going, I'm going to heaven, but I'm watching the real Christians down there run around. Whenever you hear that, run away from it. Don't listen to it. That is not what Paul is teaching. It's not two kinds of Christians. A more careful, in my estimation, a more careful reading of the entire chapter in its context makes clear that Paul is talking about lost and saved people. Unbelieving and believing people. Now, can you see the difference in what that doctrine works out to mean if you take the first view that I just gave you? Oh, here's the, here's the grandstand Christians. No crowns, but they're all going to heaven. When the preacher should be standing down at the bottom of the grandstands pleading with them to repent of their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus. Oh, well, no crowns for him. Oh, well, see in heaven. No, that is not what Paul is saying. Those who walk according to the Spirit are not condemned, our text says. If you're walking in the Spirit, you're not condemned. The obvious obverse is that you are condemned if you're not walking in the Spirit. And that is exactly Paul's point. <laughs> Those who walk according to the Spirit are not condemned. Why? Because they are in Christ. This is Paul's argument. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Not that just talk religion. In other words... As Paul describes in chapter 6 of Romans, believers are baptized into Christ's death and resurrection. Glory to God. And God's Spirit has brought them into a living, supernatural, spiritual union with the crucified and resurrected Savior. That's real. That's, that's not a, a nice religious thought written down on paper somewhere. This is something by which we live. This is how we become overcomers. Didn't Christ tell his churches in the book of Revelation? Those that overcome. How did they, how did they overcome? Oh, well, they were sitting up in the bleachers. No. When you're converted, you're brought into union with the living Savior. 
The very power that holds the universe together dwells in you. And that's why you will go on with Christ. Because he, by his power, loves his people. He strengthens them. He loves them so that he died to wash away all their sins, their nasty sins. Think about your wicked life and think that it was the blood of Christ coming down from his head, his hands and feet that washed it all away before the judge of heaven. Can you not love him with fire? Oh, God help us. Let me tell you what, American evangelicalism has fooled thousands, maybe millions, and eased them into an understanding of the word of God that actually takes away what would give them true assurance. Resting on everything that Jesus was and everything that Jesus did. There is the comfort and the foundation of your assurance. He did exactly what the Father gave him to do. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And he that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. It's because... We have a perfect Savior who's done everything infinitely necessary to save his people and to keep them. And one of the most glorious aspects of it is we're not just little old sinners, you know, who are just walking around seeking for a piece of bread. But by the mighty power, the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit, these weak and feeble vessels of dust fit for nothing but being wadded up and cast into hell for, because of our sins. We're in union with the living Christ, the Holy One of God. In union with Him. You can walk with Him because you're in union with Him if you're a Christian. This is what Paul is ultimately driving at. We're going to see this more clearly, I hope. I hope I don't, um, I hope I don't make this muddy. In Christ are two of the most beautiful words in the Bible. In Christ. In Christ. When was the last time you woke up in the morning and said, I don't know what's coming today, but I'm in Christ. Might be a good way to start the day. Might be a wonderful way to start the day. I'm in Christ. He's done everything infinitely necessary to save and keep me. I know how weak I am. I know how limited I am. I wish I didn't have to say it, but I know how sinful I am. At least I know that I still sin. God probably sees it far worse than I do. But I'm in Christ. That's an immediate change of picture. Darkness, light, I'm in Christ. So there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ. We're in union with that blessed Savior. <clears throat> Those who are in Christ. Now, follow with me. We've got to follow the text here. <clears throat> Those who are, uh, 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 who are in Christ live according to the power of the Spirit. That's what it means when it says after the Spirit. It means according to the Spirit. Well, what do we mean according? Well, it means that God has given us his spirit. We're alive spiritually in the spirit. That is how we're united with Christ. And we walk with him because there's life in us. It's a life that comes from deep down and works its way out. It's not something that I can take and just stick on and wire on here and there. Do I look religious now? You don't need that. Your life will say it if you're in union with Christ. Your life will say it. I still sin. I'll say, right, Paul's talking about that. We'll get there. Well, I feel weak. Good. Feel weaker. Because you will trust you until you have nothing else to hope in but Christ. You will take your strengths and you will trust them instead of trusting the perfect and finished work of Christ. 
Well, <clears throat> when we repent of our sins, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, God in His glory gives us the what we call the gift of the Holy Spirit, and therefore the justified life, as I said, is a Spirit-filled life, a Spirit-empowered life. It's the highest kind of life you can live in this world. And it's under a cross. We walk under a cross. Wait, I didn't sign up for that. Thought I was just signing up for heaven. The Lord says, if, you, if you're coming, come walk with me under the cross. No man can be my disciple unless he, desi- un- unless he denies himself daily. And takes up the cross. Well, those are hard words. Let me go and buy a commentary so that I can explain it away. Well, I'm telling you, friends, this book is living. This book is a fire that purges those that fool with it or it condemns them. It's either life giving or it's damning. The Paul is talking about. Life, real life. It may not look like real life to the world. That may be all about yachts and football teams and gold and platinum records and and all of the awards. Isn't it amazing that human beings constantly find ways to award themselves? It's all around us, all the time. Oh, you made such a great movie. Here, take this statue. Oh, you you ran faster than everybody else. Here's your statue. Of course, if they they keep going the way they're going, nobody's going to win anything because that would be You know, hateful. You didn't give him. He was last in the race. We'll stop the races. Right? I mean, I am telling you, our culture is losing its mind. It's losing its mind. You are watching a nation coming apart at the seams because it left God and his word. And now it's imploding on itself. Wake up. Live this life in union with Christ. Holiness. Go ahead and be hated by the world. If you want to be popular, leave Christianity. I mean, of course, you can always start your own ministry and and be on the Internet soon and, and have tons of followers until you say something wrong. You still find people that would love you. I'm telling you, friends. Wake up and get alone with God. Seek his face with everything in you and learn his book. Learn his doctrines. Quit wasting time on things that are eating away your spiritual health. Get to Christ. It's better. It's better. Get alone with Christ and then get with his people and love each other so much that the world can't stand it. No, no, y'all need to have a good split. No, I'm going to be the peacemaker. I'm going to do everything that I can to to walk with that hard-headed brother, that bad attitude sister. Should have reversed that. I'm sure women got offended with that. But I'm just saying anybody that's giving you trouble, love them. Stop making your little packs. Those who are in Christ live according to the power of the Holy Spirit. God gives us that spirit. And as I said, it is the highest kind of life that we can live in this world. But it's something that has to be cultured. It's something that has to be cultivated. The Holy Spirit of God, the very power of the world to come, enables every believer To live by faith in Christ. Every regenerate soul will make it to glory. But not every professing Christian will. You must be born again. The Holy Spirit enables a life of faith in Christ. That's why we go on. I would have quit the ministry a long time ago if it had to do with how... uh, how, how public, how uh, popular, how 
how many hits do I have on sermon audio? You know, just having to deal with some of God's people. Oh, man, that's about as much fun as a hernia. This is real, and I want you to taste it, and I want you to walk in it, because you're going to need it in the days ahead. You're going to need it in the days ahead. So as we see, with the Spirit working in the heart of God's people, <clears throat> empowering the believer one of the things that it empowers the believer to do is to mortify the deeds of the body. Christ has accomplished everything necessary to save us, to justify us, and to sanctify us. He gives us a spirit, and we live according to the spirit. As the spirit takes us to the word, enlightens us, educates us, teaches us to walk with him. And one of the things he teaches us to do is to mortify the deeds of the body. That's central for everything else that follows here in the chapter. The spirit of life, secondly, frees us from the principle of sin and death. <clears throat> Paul says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The word law here does not mean a specific command from God. We see the law of the Spirit. It, it doesn't mean uh, God has pronounced a law like the Ten Commandments or any of the other things that he commands or forbids. And, and that's, that's why the study of words is, is an important thing. All of us know that, that words, generally speaking, have different meanings. And they have different nuances. And it's only context that tells you, generally speaking, what, it's, what it means. The word law here means a principle. A principle within the believer in Christ that rules him like a law. It is the principle of God's spirit of life. Every believer has a new law, a new principle that governs him. What governed him before? His flesh, his desires, his ego, his pride, his lusts. That's what guides men. But in the glorious grace of God, the amazing grace of God, he comes and he sets a new principle within us. It's a beautiful the law of the spirit of life. Don't you understand that the lost man lives in death? He's dying on the way to eternal death. Every lost soul, every lost soul is just dying. Whatever they love. Oh, I want to be an actor. Oh, I want to be a scientist. Oh, I want to be a doctor. Oh, I want to be a nurse. Oh, I want to be a whatever. A mathematician. And that's what they live for. And that's what they go for. I want to be beautiful. I will only spend 20 of the hours of the day in front of the mirror. To make sure that that happens. So that when everybody sees me, they think, oh, how beautiful. Oh, how stunning. Oh, how tasteful. But when we're alive in Christ, it's the spirit of life living for the stuff that tickles your fancy is death. Unless what tickles your fancy is whatever God commands. Here's what I want to do. I want to serve Christ till I drop. Is that the way we think? Or is it just, okay, yeah, make sure I'm going to heaven. Now I got some important stuff to do. Yeah. It's a life. It's a walk. It's a romance. It's real. It's a union. We know the living Christ. How glorious. How beautiful he is. 
He's beautiful. When you go to the pages of Scripture, it's not a velvet painting with a big tear. There's a Christ there, and he feeds the soul. He satisfies the longing soul. So there's a new principle working within a Christian. It is the spirit who works in believers to free them from the principle of sin and death that enslaves them and condemns them. God so loves his people, he doesn't just wash their slate clean. We would all be grateful if he just did that, right? But his love for us is far beyond anything that we can possibly imagine. He's not only done everything necessary so that we would be declared righteous, he's come and he he messes around on the inside. He works in your heart. He gives you a new heart. He doesn't fix the old one. Oh, here's my heart, Jesus. That's slogan Christianity. He doesn't want your heart. He wants the new heart that he puts in you. He does say, give me your heart, but he's talking to his people. The lost person's heart is a dunghill. What are you offering him? Here, take my heart. I'll come live in this. No, he doesn't do that. The promise of the new covenant is a new heart. A new heart. He promises a new heart. That's why you want new things. That's why you want him. That's why you love his laws. That's why you love his word. That's why you love his people. He works on the inner principle. There's filth in you. There is desires that would, that would make him take you and damn you forever. But he gives you a new command central. And you begin to love his ways. Oh, overnight, you, you don't become perfect. You're not going to get perfect in this world. But you know what? Instead of loving sin, you start learning how to hate it. Not just hating the bad consequences it brings to you, but you begin to hate it because it's an offense to your loving Heavenly Father. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know this? And I know some of you do. I know some of you do. Some of you don't. This is real. When Jesus said to the religious man, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Why does the clearest uh, uh, presentation of the new birth come with Jesus talking to a religious man, not a harlot, not a drunk, not, and you can name all the stuff that people like to get up in the pulpit and rail about, and you know, sometimes it's really worth railing about it, but the fact of the matter is he's telling A religious man who's utterly convinced he's going to the glory of God. And Jesus says, are you a teacher of God's people and you don't understand this? You must be born again. You must be born again. And it shows itself in various ways. God gives you that spirit of life. He works in the control center. He begins, I mean, it's just remarkable. When the Lord saved that that extraordinary man, Robert Murray McChain, for a year, he still went to parties. He still went to parties. He still went to some card games. He still did some of the this stuff and that stuff. And then he began to say, why am I doing this? Why am I, why am I going here? Now, this isn't edifying. Why, how did he come to that? He had a new heart. And he was starting to read the word and he was starting to pray. And as you do things like that, you begin to become aware of yourself and of the things around you, of the things that glorify God and the things he's going to destroy this planet for. He works on the inside. It's a principle a principle of life, a principle of power. You may not feel it, not right away. You may not feel it much in your life, but if it's there, it's going to be working in your mind. It's going to be working in your heart. It's going to be drawing you to what's holy instead of what's cool. 
It's going to be drawing you to Christ, not the world. In other words, sinful human beings could not keep the law of God. Oh, sorry, I left out a passage. Paul continues, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. What was the problem with the law? Us. The flesh. We couldn't do it. Weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and force and condemn sin in the flesh. So, in other words, sinful human beings could not keep the law of God and the law offered no power to help them. When you go and cling to the law, you're clinging to that which can only damn you if you're trying to be right with God. Now, you can look at the law of God and see the beauty of it as righteousness and learn how to walk in that righteousness which you have from the Lord Jesus Christ. But when you want to be right with God because of your works of the law, you are in diametrical opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, God sent his eternal son into the world to become Jesus the Christ, Jesus the God-man. The glory of the incarnation stands before us in this text. It's one of the greatest miracles that's ever happened in this sphere, in this globe. God, the eternal son of God, became man. He became man, the glory the beauty, the altogether loveliness of that man. And Jesus became flesh so that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So I told you we could stop at every one of these verses. And these are filled with truth that expands and opens the hearts and minds of men and women when illuminated by the Holy Spirit. Earthly things begin to fade in their impressiveness. Well, Jesus kept the law of God perfectly. That's, I'm going to stop that point right there. He kept the, 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 the law of God perfectly and by that won a perfect righteousness for those that believe. This is another reason there's no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. Now, the carnal mind is the enemy of God, and the spiritual mind is life and peace. The text here is beautiful. This is verses 5 through 11, by the way. The last was 2 through 4. The text here is beautiful. It's solemn. It's helpful for God's people. Oh, my brethren, listen. These words are powerful. You read the book of Job. How powerful are right words. And these are right words right here. Listen carefully. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Or neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Again, this is not two types of Christians. This is lost people. Versus saved people. And that's what brings the weight of this passage home to our hearts. Now. It goes on to say. But ye are not by the way. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. 
the only way to please God is by faith. So what that is telling you is they have no faith. They are lost people. They have no faith in God because it produces nothing. Ye are not in the flesh. Ye are not in... What? Doesn't that sound odd? Uh, be honest. You're not in the flesh. Well, what am I in? Uh, what do you mean? Why did Paul put it in those words? I'm afraid sometimes we just read and go, mm -hmm, religious stuff, and keep on going. We don't want to do that. With the revelation of God to transform us. The carnal mind is enmity against God. Can't, it's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not. Ye are not in the flesh. But in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ. He is none of his. And if spirit be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. That's beautiful. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Notice the ifs that Paul, actually the Holy Spirit, keeps putting in here. If, if, if. They're put there as sign markers for us to say, okay, is this true of me? Is this true of me? If, if, if the Spirit dwells in you that raised up Christ from the dead, he shall also quicken, make alive your mortal bodies by the Spirit that dwelleth in you. Mm, this is a beautiful and a rich text. Uh, here we must put on our running shoes. Here Paul gives us a radical contrast, a radical contrast contrast should be obvious by this paragraph that those who live after the flesh are not carnal Christians they're lost people in desperate need of the Savior in desperate need of the Savior lost and damned souls what you and I were before God saved us by his amazing grace So what do we see in the carnal-minded here? What do we see? What a foreboding description we have here. Those who live after the flesh, that is, what do we mean? Live after the flesh? What do we mean by that? Well, what we mean is that their lives are governed by their sinful nature. Their lives are governed by their sinful nature. In other words, they do what they want to do, at least as much as they can. There's always going to be somebody that's going to get in your way. But the fact of the matter is, even when it looks like we're going along to get along, there's a heart in there that's thinking some things. Either things that are honoring to the living God or things that just come up out of your nasty flesh. All right? Let's be honest before the glorious and burning eyes of Almighty God because we're going to stand before Him. We're closer to that day. What's wrong with those who live after the flesh? It says they mind the things of the flesh. M-I-N-D. They mind the things of the flesh. They only think about fleshly, worldly things in themselves. In fact, when they do stuff for other people, it's generally so that everybody thinks they're so nice and wonderful. Not because it's like, I want to do this because I want to glorify the living God. He saved me. He showed a kindness to me. Let me show that kindness to everybody that I can. Now, they mind the things of the flesh. Paul then declares solemnly that carnal mindedness leads to death. They are spiritually and will physically die in this world, and they will suffer eternal death in hell. It's called the second death.
That's a lot different than saying, oh, he's not going to get many crowns, isn't it? Hell. Some of you are going there if you don't turn to Christ. This is not Aesop's fables. This is the word of God. The carnal mind is God's enemy. It will not submit to God's law and in its depravity it cannot it cannot because it will not. The lost man lives for his will. One of the ways, you know, if somebody's, if God has opened somebody's heart is while it takes them a while to get there, while nobody does it perfect, man, they just want to walk with Jesus. When, any, when anybody's just like, you know, this is my life, man, I'm going to do what I want to do. They, the Holy Spirit hasn't dealt with them. I mean, regeneration is the crushing of your sinful, God-hating will. And it turns it into a sweet thing that loves the will of God. Therefore, as Paul says, the carnally minded person cannot in any way please God. It is a rebellious, wicked, and self-worshipping heart. As the epistle of the Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Once again, I bring that verse in. Because these are lost people. The flesh-controlled, fleshly-minded man, woman, or child is dead in his trespasses and sins, a slave to the prince of the power of the air. They live thinking and fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. They are children of wrath and will not stand in the day of judgment if they do not repent and believe. The gospel says, come. The gospel says, come. Repent. Believe. Trust Jesus Christ alone. Well, what do you see in the spiritually minded What do we see in the spiritually minded? Because of God's grace in Jesus Christ, the spiritually minded soul here lives by and for the things of the Holy Ghost that dwells within them. Now listen. There's always a problem for preachers. On one hand, they have a responsibility to encourage and strengthen the weak and limping. They also have the responsibility of smoking out the hypocrites. Now, Paul does this in the things that he writes. This is not something made up by men. We have a responsibility to hold forth Christ, to preach him, so that, so that people will see his beauty and, and believe him. But how do we do that? There's something we have to climb over. It's called their depravity. We have to preach in such a way that men and women and children understand their wickedness. Or you will never love the Christ of the Bible. Or you'll love a Jesus that you make up. You, you can go to churches everywhere and find a real nice uh, peachy Jesus. Oh, he makes me feel better. Oh, wonderful. I've got Jesus, the great psychologist. But if you want the Christ of the Bible, he only saves sinners. That's the only people he's interested in. He only saves sinners. So I don't ever want to crush the bruised reed, the smoking flax, I want the Lord's people, I mean, even if your fire has burned down, it's just embers. There's an ash heap there, and you know there's a few coals in there. I don't want to discourage one. Look to Christ. 
Love Christ. Rest in Christ. Remember how he dealt with you. Remember how he saved you. Remember how the gospel came to you and you trusted and believed him. And for whatever reason that that fire is burned down, call out to him. He's the one that continues to pour the oil in to his weak and feeble ones. He loves every one of his lambs. When you go after the hypocrite, unfortunately, genuine believers often take it to heart. Oh, he's talking about me. Do you love Christ? Are you walking with him? I didn't ask you if it was hard. Of course it's going to be hard. The Christian life's hard. But Christ is with you at every step. He's given absolutely everything that you need to walk with him. So if, if any of you feel mashed, well, come talk and, and we'll pray. I want you resting in Christ. I want every hypocrite to be smoked out and running to Jesus. I will do everything I can to knock out every prop from under you. And you got plenty of them. Sometimes I can, I can I play with, with the, the hypocrite like a pinata. I can be blindfolded and I can hit him. Because it takes one to know one. Okay, so the spiritually minded, an extended footnote there. <clears throat> what we want to consider is that they are not in the flesh. They're not in the flesh. What does that mean? Of course, they're living. They have a body. There's that skin. There's all those muscles. There are all the innards. He's alive. She's alive. What does he mean? He's not in the flesh. It means that his life lived does not arise from the depraved a heart within him. Something happened. A great transition happened. God came and gave him a new heart. And the Spirit of God dwells there. The citadel in your holy of holies. The very God that said, let there be light. And the power that brought it to pass dwells in you. The very power that raised up Jesus from the dead has raised your dead soul to life. And he's still there. He will never leave you. Hold on to that. It's true. The spiritually minded person thinks of the things of the spirit. Ah, I know we all get dragged down by our flesh. I'm not saying you never think anything wrong. I, there aren't any perfect people never going to be in this world. There will be in the world to come. So, well, let's, let me stop there because this is too big a point. I thought I would have that done. <clears throat> we will finish going to verse 11 next week and then into verses 12, 13, and 14 because, and let me close it at this point. <clears throat> why are we taking all this time? Why, why are we looking at these verses? Why are we talking about all this stuff? Why don't we just get to mortification? Because the word of God given by the Holy Spirit through Paul, in this passage, puts the responsibility for mortification on you. It puts it on you. Why? Because God has done all these things to you and for you. You have what it takes to start becoming a skillful sin assassin. A sin executioner. Are you doing that? That's what Paul is talking about. I've given you everything. I've given you the power. I hear people say all the time, well, I can't do it. God's got to do it. Well, okay. If you're not doing it, what does that tell you about what God's doing? If it's a command of the scripture and you're saying, oh, well, you know, I'm just waiting for God to do it. <clears throat> you better read that passage really clearly because it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. If you think, oh, I've got God and he's got to do it. Well, then you ought to be doing it, right? Let's read the Bible. Let's 
ask God to teach us what it means. We can learn what it says, but we've got to learn what it means. So mortification is actually a command from God to us. We want to get to work. This, and you see, Owen understood this. That's why I started with his quote. He spent all of this time in Romans chapter 8. He tracks it out through the scriptures. And he says, now here's the deal. If you're not mortifying sin, you don't have the spirit. If you don't have the spirit, you are none of his. You say, well, I, you know, I didn't know that, but I'm just hearing about this. Okay, well... Spend more time in the scriptures. And number two, repent. God's people fail. God's people don't understand some of the things they're supposed to do. But when the Lord makes them clear, what should we do? Out of the love for him, we ought to do it with all of our hearts because of his great love. Well, we're going to stop. Mortification is the killing of your sins. We want to understand what that means and how to do it. And Christ will teach us. He will teach us. Amen. Oh, Father, what weakness comes out of this vessel but, Lord, your word went out. Take it and use it. Take the sword of thy spirit. Plunge where it needs to plunge. Bring the healing balm of the gospel where there needs to be healing. Lord, for the struggling saint, oh, I would not set a, a stumbling block before them. Lord, if there's a, a stumbling and wrestling saint, encourage his heart, her heart. Strengthen their souls. Build them up in the faith. Help them to understand in the weeks ahead what it really means to mortify the deeds of the body. Help us by the mighty power of thy spirit. Help us to live in its glorious power. We can't do it in ourselves, Lord. Our flesh is weak and pathetic. Take away any strength that keeps us from leaning on thee. And help us to walk with our master. We love thee, Lord Jesus. Oh, love thy people. Encourage and build them up. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, please stand with me. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. And the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's go in the name of Jesus.